Hello, you are watching Captains of Industry from uh, Kigali, Rwanda. I am Godfrey Mutizwa. In this program, we try to bring to you the lives of our leading executives within Rwanda's private sector. And today, I've got with me Konde Bujingo. He is the CEO of uh, BRD Commercial. Konde, thanks for your time. Thank you. So, you're a young man, but you're, young, you're a young man with a lot of experience. How did it begin? Were you always focused on coming into the financial sector? Or was it an accident? Because for most of us, I can tell you, and you can see my gray hair, uh, you grew up talking about what you saw within the village. How was it for you? It's more or less the same. Uh, we don't go any different. I think uh, I grew up hoping to be a pilot, uh, but that didn't work well for me. Uh, so I had to take the next best option, which was to go after education through accounting, commerce, uh, economics and financial services came up as, uh, as another option during my master's degree. Why couldn't you be a pilot? I think it was uh, due to the timing. I actually joined the Air Force of Rwanda okay. and spent there almost a year and a half. Yeah. Uh, and one of the leading students there, but the program to start piloting training, uh, pilot training uh, in Israel had not kicked off. Okay. So I had to decide and go private again and uh, go after my education. Okay, so you went finance? And then I went finance, and uh, you know it all got kicked off from there when I uh, went to the you know to India, to the UK, and uh, joined uh, all sorts of in, you know larger corporations yeah. uh, through corporate finance, and then ended up in uh, investment banking and uh, consulting, all through a financial type of setup, financial yeah. services. So, will uh, finance always be the second option for in your head? Is there still a pilot lingering in your head? That has now been taken over by my wife. So ah. she takes over the role. <laughs> I will now focus on finance. <laughs> so you <laughs> decided, I can't do this, but I'll go, do, I'll go there vicariously through somebody else. I think as part of what get, got us to be interested in each other is the fact that she enjoyed um, being a pilot. Right. And uh, gladly enough, she, she managed to to be one, yeah. so I will focus on finance. We'll come back and talk about family later. Let's talk a little bit about this education part and what you've gotten out of it. I think education, um, in my opinion, is something that gives you the basis, the background, the understanding of industry, mm -hmm. the understanding of the uh, nature of business stakeholders uh, and how to approach certain situations. But the real work starts when you get into the job mm. and you start to put your mind to the situations you're in, finding yeah. solutions innovatively or maybe you join the rest of the, the ranks. So yeah. You do it as, as established as it has been. Mm. But again, I think education is really a background. Mm. Uh, you, unless you're a doctor or a pilot where they teach you exactly press this button and uh -huh. do this and uh -huh. the other, yeah. uh, education gives you a very good understanding for you to use your mind right. uh, and, and, and lead institutions. However, if you want to be a technician as well, then education in terms of being an accountant, yeah. uh, being a financial analyst and so on, then yeah. again, it's more or less pressing a button and so on. Yeah. Uh, but going into leadership, education becomes a basis of where you build from. It's a tool. And absolutely. And, and the rest is really has to be personal, yeah. something that you build as a person. Yeah. yeah. Now, you're highly educated. You went to Cranfield University in the UK. You did a Master of Science in Finance and Management. When you look at what you got out of school and what you are doing now, do you find yourself using those concepts or are you having to think out of the box literally to try to make things work, especially the next topic that we're going to talk about where you are now building and where you're gearing towards? I think it, it does, absolutely gives you fun fundamentals, um, if especially fun, you know, the, the financial analysis part of things, right. financial planning, yeah. uh, business plans. Uh, structuring companies, uh, putting together um, a, a comprehensive governance models in place, um, uh, business models in place, and operating models in place. You get a lot from education. Right. Uh, but when you go into the, the real world, then your mind starts to switch on, yeah. to dig deeper and come up with some of the best innovative ideas. Uh, I can assure you that some of the best innovative ideas we have out there have not been yeah. written down yeah. uh, or been captured in any type of uh, thesis. Uh, they come in the job. Because I was going to say, you were educated in the UK, you are here in Rwanda, and we know that Rwanda is one of the faster growing economies. We also know that it's positioning itself as uh, an innovative hub. Are you finding that uh, you are able to use those ideas that you were able to learn from in the UK, and are they suitable for the African environment? I think that's a very good question because we, we tend to 
to think what we can get from the UK can absolutely come here and work. Yes. Actually, in my opinion, what you get from a country like the UK and the exposure in the UK is fundamentals. Uh, building, building things together, putting structures in place, yeah. uh, professional and best practice in place. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to finding innovative solutions, yeah. uh, in my opinion, we've, we've used less from that part of the world. Yeah. We have actually used that fundamental best practice in place to give us the opportunity to find solutions that are best suited for Rwanda. Right. And hence the reason why Rwanda is coming out as an innovation hub, because we are able to use the best of regulations in place, mm. government support, mm. the industry, the market, the environment, yeah. all sort of inhibit yeah. and support that innovative way of thinking. Right. And you come up with solutions that actually have not been done anywhere else. Mm. But mm. the fundamentals, of course, as yeah. a best practice, come from the best of the world, which is you know, one of them in the UK. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about where you are now. You are CEO of BRD Commercial. And before we came on set, we were chatting about the fact that you worked previously at Bank Populaire. Mm. And now you're finding yourself in a situation now where you are potentially now going to combine uh, the two banks. I'm saying potentially because the other acquisition processes are still ongoing. How is that going? And, uh, What's been your role in welding the two together? You know, my experience in BPR is so crucial, um, so important. It was my first job in Rwanda. As chief operating officer, there was a lot of work to be done. The bank was coming from a cooperative type of setup. Right. Uh, no connection between the branches, uh, 200 branches almost. Wow. Uh, no systems in place, no processes in place, people, uh, no structures in place. Uh, n no way, no better ways of serving clients, just like you know, simple debit cards, right. mobile, ATMs, none of that was in place. Did that make it easier to then put in just the fundamentals? Actually, yes. Because when you come and you find things um, from a raw base, yeah. it's yeah. easier to put in yeah. much newer That's a nice approach than dealing with legacy issues. Yeah. There were some legacy issues, but more or less on uh, shareholder side and so on. But uh, less on the side of you know implementing some of the best solutions out there sure so that helped a lot now um joining atlas mara which was clearly coming into africa to build a premier sub-saharan uh, african banking group we looked at rwanda as a major opportunity our funders are very fond of rwanda mm -hmm. so it was one of the first countries they actually came to to launch atlas mara and and get activity going mm -hmm. Uh, so the, the, the nature we worked through was to work with the government to separate BRD, Development right. Bank, right. Uh, which had a commercial element to it. So Atlas Mara acquired 100% of that commercial element. Of the commercial bank. Yes, and uh, the development bank remains in place and will continue doing what it does best, which right. is development impact um, uh, projects right. in the country. Yeah. Now, on the side of commercial bank, uh, as our aim is to be a, 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 a larger institution in every market we're in, top three. Yeah. Uh, it was very obvious that we have to grow much faster than it would be to, cut, to start from a greenfield. Okay. Hence the interest in uh, discussing with uh, BPR shareholders. Uh -huh. And uh, you know, as per the recent uh, press release, uh, I, I can confidently say that uh, you know, the steps have been taken really well. Right. Uh, we have now announced that the shareholders have approved the acquisition of the largest stake in BPR, mm -hmm. of Atlas Mara taking the largest stake, and also merging BRD Commercial Bank into BPR, right. but all pending the uh, regulatory approval, yes. which is the process we're taking right now. Absolutely. And yes. so where do you, when do you envisage that you complete these, and where will you be positioned when you are done? Now, um, I could not possibly comment on the timeline. Sure? Uh, that is really based on the regulator okay. to, to, to finalize their steps. Okay. Uh, however, I, I remain Atlas Mara employee, yeah. and the structure of the new bank will come in place and be announced. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking forward to the challenge. It's a very exciting challenge. Yeah. We're looking at creating a mega powerhouse in Rwanda. Are you targeting top place in terms of banking? Absolutely. Size? And Absolutely. all those other measures that we bring into, to, in, into measuring financial institutions? Absolutely. The combination of the two banks, as of today, the, the only place we take second is in terms of revenue, profitability, and uh, asset size. Bank but of Kigali is bigger on that front. Absolutely. Everything else, we take the, the number one price. Okay. And so the target is to be number one, obviously. Absolutely. Over time. I'm going to press you for a time frame. 
Um, <laughs> I would probably be hesitant to comment. <laughs> There's a lot to go through yeah. for now. But at least we have very good two years to stabilize the bank and put yeah. it in a very good stage for growth. Yeah. Um, but that will not stop us from growing in the first six months. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm speaking to Konde Bujingo. He is the CEO of uh, BRD Commercial. And as he said uh, a few minutes ago, they are merging uh, that with uh, Bank Populaire, and that will create a Rwandan bank. That's number two in terms of uh, size of assets, but in terms of all other measures, certainly the biggest. When we come back on the other side, we're going to be talking about Konde, the man, who he is, where his family, and uh, where is he aiming at. Don't go away. <music> Welcome back. You're watching Captains of Industry from uh, Kigali, Rwanda, and I am talking to Bu Konde Bujingo. He is the CEO of uh, BRD Commercial, and uh, they have recently acquired uh, Bank Populaire, and the process of uh, merging the two banks is underway. And when it comes to fruition, he is going to be leading the second largest bank in the country. And uh, he says to me, uh, they are aiming to be number one. You won't give me a time frame, but we'll certainly be bringing him in other editions of the program to understand where they are in terms of uh, taking over that number one slot. Now, we've spoken about where you have been in terms of education. We've spoken about the work experience. Let's talk about the people who have made a difference in your life and what you've taken out of them. Now, um, just for, for regulatory uh, purposes, uh, we have not taken over yet. So no, yes. the processes are underway. Yes, processes are underway, and the final um, leadership program of the bank will also be decided upon okay. in the coming months. All month. right, just okay. for the sake of okay. the market. Yeah. No, we don't want. We are, we are a listed feathers. company, <laughs> so Indeed. very important that this information is clear. Um, I, I've been fortunate enough to have a strong family. I think that's been a very important piece of my upbringing and mm. outlook on life, uh, and 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 the way, the, what shaped me. Mm. What um, is family? Family, starting from, you know, I, I lost my parents when I was very young. Okay. So, and, and, uh, my uncles have been there, have been my guardian, my aunties. So they've really given me the opportunity to study, uh, shamed, you know, shaped me properly to make sure that I, I'm ready for, for life. Yeah. And then, of course, you join, uh, you get a wife. Yes. And you have kids and yeah. so on. And yeah. your wife definitely shapes a lot in your yeah. life. Uh, so that's been also a big back, back, backbone of my uh, upbringing as well. Would you point to one further figure or, you, as you say, it's yes. uncles and it's, 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 it's the other family members? Definitely one further figure. Um, uh, one of my uncles. Yeah. Um, Please one of name the, him. One of the, uh, Mze Karimba, uh, he happens to be uh, also one of the uncles of the, the RPF. So, yeah. what 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 is he what 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 is he brought to you? What did what did he give you that you credit him with uh, helping you become the person you have been? I tell you one, you know, simple phrase he told me. You've got to be the best in in life in whatever choice you take, even though you decide to be a thief, you better be the best thief, mm -hmm. but don't take any shorter than that. So. That is a very clear statement from my uncle to tell me that it doesn't matter what job you do, you better yeah. be best at it. And he could be saying, it doesn't matter that you don't have both your parents, you can be the best that you Absolutely. can be. Absolutely. How did you lose your parents? Uh, natural cause, uh, my mother, and then my father was an accident. He was a rally driver, so that's part of life. Okay. Um, so there was always speed in the family. Yes, there was always <laughs> speed. Yeah. But of course, I can't also forget to mention the fact that, you know, through the years uh, I came, you know, I was born in Uganda, through the years we saw how our, uh, you know, our president, His Excellency, has you know grown through the ranks from Uganda and mm -hmm. came here, mm -hmm. brought some of the best he could get, and uh, he's built this country in what it is. Yeah. That's a major part of our lives, Absolutely. and has shaped who we are today. Yeah. And of course, being a banker, yeah, I, I look up to Bob Diamond. I've known him for the last ten years. I uh, was going to come to that. Bank. I was going to come to that and talk to you about. It. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, President Kagame because for me, having. Uh, studied African history and then went on to report African politics and economics over the last 30 years. I can tell you one of the striking differences that you see between Rwanda and other African countries is the difference that leadership can make to a place. We're talking about a, pl a place that was raised to the ground and inside 20 years has been rebuilt into the best governed country on the African continent, though now there are these other processes that are underway, we'll leave that for another day. 
but we are also talking about one of the fastest growing economies on the African continent. But not only content with that, there are still innovations in terms of governance. We're talking about Imihigo today and in terms of uh, uh, helping the private sector to grow. It's really been uh, outstanding, the leadership that has come from that front. What difference do you think does leadership make even inside a, 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 a private organization? Because we always tend to think of it as collective. I think, let me put it simple. Um, uh, my opinion is, you know, I lead through a, a sort of autocratic, combination of autocratic, democratic, laissez-faire, yeah. let people do what they can do as well, let them meddle their job, they're the experts. But at the same time, you have to lead by example. Sounds like you're, pretty, you're describing President Kagame. <laughs> <laughs> I, I couldn't go further from it because I have seen what it has done yeah. and I have learned through the ranks. My experience has shown me that you have to, first of all, have a, a fist that will at some point be anchored to ensure that things happen. Right. Direct people, yeah. motivate people, show them how to implement yeah. um, your plans, but at the same time let them do their job. Sure. Uh, and at the same time let also be part of the decision making. That is exactly they must what own he, the decision. Absolutely. That is what he has embodied in this country. And that was has made uh, you know, every Rwandan believe in what they see today and believe in the future, uh -huh. believe in themselves. Yeah. That's so crucial. And even in the private sector itself, that's what exactly builds a company. Mm. Uh, you have to lead by example. If you absolutely mean that you would like to reach a certain goal mm. and your team sees you take a different set to life, and ways of doing things. Yeah. I don't see how they're going to ach achieve that accomplishment yeah. uh, if you don't lead by example. And you have to also roll up your sleeves and be part of the team. Right. And, and be seen to be doing something, not be showing off to be so doing something, but you have to actually do something. Roll up your sleeves and understand what they're doing. Yeah. Be it a cleaner, be it uh, somebody who brings you water. Yeah. Get to know how they're doing, how they've spent the day. What are their views about the company? Are we in the right direction? Mm. What do they think about the brand, services, products? So crucial. So building a team comes from the leadership. Yeah. What would you say has challenged you the most in your, let me uh, uh, choose my words carefully, yeah, short uh, experience inside uh, your, your work experience? I think every, every day is a challenge. Every day is a challenge. Every day is a challenge. The fact that you come from the UK, uh, they have different sets of challenges. Yes. And then you come to Rwanda, which was a total different set of challenge for myself. When did you come back? Uh, 2009. Okay. I uh, had never worked in Rwanda, so all my life I worked in the UK. Uh, turning that around was a massive, massive challenge. The language, culturally, culturally while working, uh, people skills, understanding how what drives them, what yeah. motivates them, is a total different element to what drives people in the UK. Why did you come back? Because I imagine you were, you're comfortable in the UK. Um, I needed to build my country. I don't think you'll ever get anybody else come in as an expert or anybody else to build your own country. You have to build your own country. And at the age I was or during the struggle, I was not able to come in and struggle with the rest who, you know, who shed you know, this was your contribution. blood and people put their lives on the line. Yeah. This is my contribution as well. Yeah. Yeah. And how has it been? Superb. Any regrets? Never. I don't have regrets in life. I take them as opportunities to think different. Yeah. When you scale your achievements so far, and I've got a list here, I mean, it's, 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 it's pretty long for a young man. And I'm saying young man because, can I give you age? No, <laughs> feel free. <laughs> Not that young, but feel free. You're a, you're a young man at 37. Now, when I look at your list of achievements, I mean, it's quite a lot here. What would you say ranks highest in terms of satisfaction of something that you have done? Um, I could rank them in uh, three different things. Please. Um, one is to go through a struggle of you know, upbringing and, and go through education, go to a different country and find your ways of working, of course, work in the UK at the same time and uh, studying. Uh, that was the biggest, big, big challenge. Mm -hmm. um, work full time, study full time, uh, and then finish and join uh, some of the biggest uh, companies in the UK. Mm -hmm. And then the second one is building a family. You know, getting a wife, kids, mm -hmm. Uh, modeling them into what we works for us, mm. um, a, sto a, a stable, strong family today that builds mm. who I am today. Mm -hmm. And then um, thirdly is uh, the, the my work, getting engaged with different companies. But what drives me and has been biggest challenge and achievements is uh, yeah. joining companies that are almost in the stage of stage four 
of going bust. Right. Stage five of going bust. You know, BPR when we came in and Rubber Bank came in, it was at a stage where it was actually going into bankruptcy and there were serious challenges then and we turned it around mm -hmm. with the whole team mm -hmm. and put it to profitability costs with the innovation and, and better serving of the clients. Yeah. And then, of course, I left BPR, went to R-Switch, which was already in bankruptcy as well, let okay. me say, um, and had uh, only experts on board. Uh, there was no future for the company. Visa had just come into the company to become the second um, uh, switch, which is a competitor directly, and right. Visa is a, is a the massive the company. It's the, 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 the big boy. Uh, the big but gorilla. today, run the switch uh, is stable. Uh, we also sold it from the old, com old uh, shareholders to uh, Milcom, which yeah. is a massive uh, blue chip in the world. Yeah. That's a major step. Uh, but to turn it around yeah. from loss making, where it was being sold for one dollar, yes. to being sold almost, uh, you know, a very high amount to mm. towards seven million dollars mm. was very, very important mm. and, and also a big, big challenge for me. But a huge achievement and satisfaction uh, to see it uh, turn around and doing very well right to the right now doing very well yeah i want to come back and talk to you about uh, the kind of father that you are and i'm sure your wife might have uh, some interesting views on that front <laughs> but let's talk a little bit about working with bob diamond one of the best investment bankers in the world how has it been um you know my job is almost a privilege rather than a job wow uh, let me put it that way Working with Bob, working with Ashish, working with John. Ashish um, Thaka, we yes, must mention. Ashish Thaka. The young well. millionaire from uh, Uganda, but also British uh, descent. And very, very, so very. Sorry, British uh, citizen. Absolutely. Yeah. But also a very good son of Rwanda, let me put it that way. He was right. involved in the whole, in the whole uh, history of the genocide. Yes, yes, his family ran here, actually, we were here when the genocide so was he taking place. So this country is so dear to him. Uh, so, uh, working with them and also, of course, uh, my current direct boss, which is uh, John Vitalo, mm -hmm. the CEO of Atlas Mara. Right. I mean, working with these three individuals. Ex Barclays as well. Absolutely, ex, ba ex Barclays. Very, very important piece of Barclays. Um, so, working with them has been huge for me. Mm -hmm. But directly working with Bob Diamond, who personally, when I was in the UK, I would pass through the city and look up to his office. Yeah. And think, how would I ever in my world ever Absolutely. sit down at the same table with, with this gentleman guy. and learn banking? Because what he did for Barclays to bring it yeah. from where it was to yes. what it is today yeah. is remarkable. And for me to sit on the same table and he considers me as part of his team to bring ideas and shape his, yeah. you know, be part of the shaping of this company yeah. is a privilege. What kind of boss is he? Just like... Uh, is he intrusive? No. Very, very prudent, straight to the point, and leaves you to do your job. Right. Simple as that. And you've enjoyed it? I have enjoyed it every piece and I continue to enjoy and I look forward to another, um, to more years of enjoying this job. Yeah. Absolutely. Another conversation we'll talk about where Atlas Mara is going as a company on the African continent because it's an interesting example, mm -hmm. isn't it? Uh, almost like it's, it's a private equity firm that's coming to the African continent is really making a big difference. Another day. Let's talk about Conte the father, the man in the home. What kind of a father are you? Tough. <laughs> tough father. I am. Uh, let me be honest. How I, many I kids are there? Two, two okay. boys. Yeah. Two tough boys. I They're think in trouble. They are. I, I get my, my experience from my uncle. Um, uh, he's a tough man. Uh, everybody who knows him knows that that's one of the toughest men you'll ever meet in your life. <laughs> and, you know, he taught me how to fix a car, how to wash a car, how to drive a car, how to do everything as a boy and make sure that you contribute to the family from an early age. Yeah. Be uh, it five years old, seven years old, he taught me everything. And that also shaped me to understand that this is the way you contribute to a home. You don't just sit down as a, as, as a boy, a young child, and you think that's, that's just part of your job. Come sit down, kick off your shoes, read the newspaper, no. and occasionally shout, hey, go back. So if it's education, it's education. If it's home, then we contribute to the home. And if you've done something wrong, then you pay for it. You learn that you never do it again. So that's a sort of, but again, I won't also shy from the fact that there was love. Yeah. And you can also show love by being tough. Absolutely. So um, very close with my boys. So I spend a lot of time with them. The yeah. whole weekend is usually with them. Nothing has to disrupt that. So yeah. as you asked me earlier about managing my time, yeah. the weekend is about family. You divide your time, as you say, between, I mean, we've talked about the rescues that you have done and you, we've talked about your responsibilities now and also in terms of building a new entity out of two uh, different entities. Do you find time to do any charity work? I do, absolutely. What um, do you do? Uh, I personally prefer to actually engage people directly. So 
m my opinion, charity doesn't have to be that you have to go through a certain char charity. Mm. My opinion is that whoever is around you, sh you should help them. What? So you, that, that, that you actually physically contribute yourself? Absolutely. So I will start with my, 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 my guys at home, my helpers. You have to be part of their lives. If they're looking after your child and looking after your home, you have to start with them. You know, you have to ensure that they, they, what they see is what, if what they see you in is what they aspire to be. Mm -hmm. So you have to help them to raise their lives, first of all, yeah. their families. That's, very, that's been very key for me, for yeah. at least from, from, from the time I've begun this work. Yeah. And then beyond that, look around your area where you live. Then beyond that, go and look around the country as well. Sure. So whoever you meet, whether on the roadside or be it anywhere during work, yeah. you have to contribute to their lives through a way of giving back to life. Yeah. So you don't have to absolutely be, you know, associated with certain charity. In my opinion, is charity starts from your own doorstep. Absolutely. Yeah. So when we speak to you in another five years, where will you be? I think five years would be a bit short for me to <laughs> say the biggest uh, ambition that I have. Sure. Um, my, my plan is to at least um, build the largest conglom conglomerate here myself. In Rwanda. Yes. And hopefully I will also bring, and I'm being crazy, but I have to put the point across, bring Formula One to Rwanda. We have run out of time. As I said, Conde uh, Bujingo, he's the CEO of uh, BRD Commercial. Formula One is coming to Rwanda. That's what he said. And Formula One, in addition to that, uh, there's also going to be, of course, uh, the biggest conglomerate in Rwanda, built by him. He said it. Thank you for watching Captains of Industry. Until another time, goodbye. Thank you.